Uh, it's the first album from A Thin Lizzy. Look What The Wind Just Blew In is the name of that song. The album is simply called A Thin Lizzy. So I'm going to go back a little bit earlier, uh, Philip, for this one. That is well, back as far... back earlier than uh, that. Oh, I can go back as far as The Black Eagles. Oh, so tell us about The Black Eagles, Brian Downey and Peter on vocals. And we'll say, like, around 63, 64... Like, how did that all start? How, how, how did you meet Brian? How did it all get together? I know it's been well documented everywhere else, but it's never been on the rock show before. Um, we used to play around. We, we were both in bands, uh, you know, just local bands playing around. And uh, we were looking for a drummer that could play uh, a backbeat, you know, which is like independence of the bass drum and the snare. And the best way we could do that was with uh, Tell That, was with... You really got me by the Kings because yeah. that had that. Dum, 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 you see, so uh, Brian Downey had seen us a few times, and we'd seen him. So uh, we uh, put the word out, and he came down to auditions, and we uh, rehearsed in the thing. The minute he could play that beat, he had the job. Besides, he said he had a, a, a tom tom, which the other drummer didn't have at the time. So that's how. Um, then we found out that we were going to the same school and that we knew each other. So. Yeah. So like then after that came Skid Row with Bruce Shields and Ted Carroll and yourself. Yeah, but Brian didn't join Skid Row. He went off to be with the Sugar Shack. The Sugar Shack. Yeah. And like what about Benny Cheevers? He was there on guitar as well. Yeah, he was in the original one. Yeah. And then it was Gary Moore who came in, right? So yeah. where are we now then? Like what? What was the lineup when Gary came in? Uh, Nolik Bridgman on drums, Brush on bass. And vocals, myself on vocals, and Gary Moore on guitar. Well, like, what was it like in those early days? Because you've always admitted that you were into image more than anything else <laughs> in those days. Is is that true? Yeah. Totally. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> and like, what about then the band Orphanage? After that, was was did the band Orphanage come after that business of like with all those people first? Like, you had Gary and you had Brian, and then a band called Orphanage. Yeah. With Pat Quigley and Joe Staunton. Yeah, that's it. And Brian Downey. Yeah, and Terry Woods. And Terry Woods as well. Did yeah. Terry Woods actually play in a band? Yeah, with we you did one we gig in uh, John of Gods, and he got up and he played uh, Clock Old Hemp with the Railroad Man. And right. Another one, I forget now. <laughs> but we had a few of them. And uh, the object was that people could come and have a blow with us and didn't have to be in the band and stuff. Because yeah. at that time, a lot of the folk artists were getting uh, interested by the electronics. You know, so yeah. uh, it, you know, hope, at the time we thought like it, we were the band that could uh, help them out in that respect, but it didn't work out that way, you know. Well, like around this time, then Eric Bell came along as well, and like you were very impressed with the way he had played. He'd come down from the north. Yeah, he so, was with the Dream Show band at the time. Yeah, that's right, and like he was, a, he was a better guitarist than what you had in the band at the time. So he decided to just bring in Eric and form things. No, it's just basically I wanted to play bass myself, you know, and uh, Eric was prepared to form a band where I could play the bass, you know, so I hopped out on one and then to the other. Yeah, you know? and why did Eric leave the band? The Dreams? Yeah, no, From no. From Lizzie? Yeah. I just got tired of the pressure, the touring and that, you know, and uh, after the success of Whiskey and the Jar, there was an awful lot of pressure on the band to... Uh, yeah. Keep you know, uh, people wanted us to record. It's a long, long way to Tipperary. Rocked up, or Danny Boy rocked up, which we did with Black Rock. <laughs> but uh, you know, people wanted us to do that, and everybody was coming up and telling us what we should be doing, and uh, it wasn't going too well. And the pressure, like we were flying out to France to mime to records, and yeah. Eric just wanted to play the guitar really, and uh, couldn't understand that why like you had to do these sort of things you know well, so in the end it just got to him and he said and his amp started feeding back on new year's eve so he kicked over his amp and walked out the stage the audience loved it they thought it was part of the act right because like a lot a lot of the like contemporary dublin bands that i have in the program like they spend they always say well listen we have to go to london sooner or later we're going to have to go and an awful lot of them have stayed around for two or three years here whereas when thin lizzy formed in 1970 ted carroll brought you over to britain in 71 now, like, uh, by the time, in other words, that you were like young enough still as a band, you were suddenly in London. So, like, what would, like were those pressures? Did they affect yourself and Brian as much as they might have affected Eric? Yeah, in a way, you know. But I mean, it didn't get to us. Our arms didn't feed back on that night. <laughs> because it, it it did take a long time to get that hit single, "Whiskey in the Jar." Yeah. 
And then after that, things didn't work out the way they should have at all because things you didn't, didn't get work a, out on the farm. At all, on the right? farm at all, no. Because like you, you didn't get a hit with Randolph's Tango or anything like that. Yeah, and we weren't too bothered though, because at the time there was this big thing about uh, you were an LP band or you were a, a pop band, you know. And we were we preferred to have the integrity than have the success. Yeah, because like you were like even as a teenager, you were the lead singer with Skid Row, and that like that was in the days of Brush, say. And yeah. uh, like after that, then Thin Lizzy were not meant to be as big as Skid Row. Skid Row were the band who were going to make it. So did you feel like uh, proud of the fact that you made it before, say Skid Row did, in terms of like? Well, Skid Row actually did have that first album sort of charted really high, and they had a great reputation. I mean, in uh, England when we went over, and for a while, like we lived off of, you know, like. Yeah, I used to be in Skid Row and everybody got yeah, yeah, that's true, but like know, after so 34 hours, like nothing much happened with Skid Row. Well, you can say, yeah, make an album in 34 hours, you can imagine what it sounded like. You know, but it was not. It was nothing against the band. The band were really going down well, live, you know. Yeah. And the breaks just didn't go their way, you know, whereas they went their way. I mean, I mean such a fluke with Whiskey in the Jar, because that was supposed to be a B-side. And then that, uh, because of the success of that, people, like, kept an interest in us and we were able to get good enough on stage to do a good live act and then we've always had a good rep for uh, doing a good live show so even if the records weren't going well we could tick over yeah. with the live show you know because with a three-piece band there wasn't that many overheads so we could keep it going. <laughs> 